years ago, uh, I was actually a Darwinist as an undergraduate in the 60s. Uh, in the 70s, I began reading more widely. I became interested in various aspects of the controversy, and I became skeptical of Darwin's mechanism. The idea that <clears throat> variation and selection can produce new species and organs and body plans. But I wasn't skeptical of common ancestry until much later. In fact, it wasn't until I became a graduate student at the University of California at Berkeley and began to look at the evidence for common ancestry that I became skeptical of that. My specialty was embryology, so the first thing I noticed was that the embryo drawings in biology textbooks <clears throat> are not, uh, do not represent the embryos. The actual embryos look quite different. And from there I went and looked at other evidence for common ancestry and realized that uh, it's actually not a fact, as Darwin's claim it is. In fact, it's a very speculative hypothesis. And uh, my skepticism has been growing since then. It seems that every time I learn something new about biology, I'm even more skeptical of Darwin's theory. The more I learn, the worse it gets. The core of Darwin's theory is actually the idea that small changes within existing species, or microevolution, lead over time to macroevolution, or the origin of new species, new body plans, new organs. And Darwin had no evidence for that. In fact, he had no evidence for natural selection. All he could offer in the origin of species was what he called uh, a few imaginary illustrations of natural selection. Well, now we have evidence for natural selection, but it only produces small changes within existing species. Well, Darwin didn't write a book called How Existing Species Change Over Time. If he had, it would have been a crashing bore. He wrote a book called The Origin of Species by Means of Natural Selection. And for this, we have no evidence. Nobody has ever observed the origin of a new species by variation and selection. There have been reports in the, in the literature, but they all turn out to be exaggerated or false. So in fact, there is no solid evidence, no direct evidence, that microevolution leads to macroevolution, and therefore no direct evidence that Darwin's theory is true. The biggest thing we know now that Darwin didn't know is genetics. Uh, interestingly enough, Mendel, Gregor Mendel, who founded the discipline of genetics, wrote during Darwin's lifetime. Uh, but his theory of genetics contradicted Darwin's, and so Darwinists ignored Mendel. Finally, in the 1930s, Darwinists embrace, embraced Mendel's theory of genetics because by then there was considerable ev evidence for it. But uh, the, the mix, the, the combination has never been quite uh, as smooth as we are sometimes led to believe. Uh, genetic mutations, for example, were thought after the 1930s to be the source of new variations for Darwin's evolutionary theory. But in fact, mutations are almost always harmful. <clears throat> and the few we know that aren't harmful have very minor effects. So we now know, for example, that we can mutate the, the fruit fly embryo all we want. And there are only three possible outcomes. A normal fruit fly, a defective fruit fly, or a dead fruit fly. No new species, no new organs, no new body plans that would survive natural selection. So genetics actually is not the help for Darwin that he thought it was. And the more we learn about genetics now from the genome projects, the worse it gets. For example, what we've been led to believe was junk DNA is not junk at all. And that's just been coming out the last few years. Much of what we hear from Darwinists promoting their theory about how much medicine needs it and how, what a boon it has been for modern science, what they're really talking about is genetics, not Darwinism at all. In fact, the major biological disciplines, most of them, were founded before Darwin by people who were, in, in most cases, quite religious. John Ray, who was a founder of botany, wrote a book called The Wisdom of God Manifested in the Works of Creation. Uh, Carl Carolus Linnaeus, who founded the discipline of systematics, whereby we name species and categorize them, was a creationist. Others include <clears throat> uh, Wolf, the embryologist, Cuvier, the paleontologist, 
Uh, Harvey, the physiologist, uh, Vesalius, the anatomist, all these fields, anatomy, physiology, botany, zoology, embryology, paleontology, comparative biology, genetics, were all founded either by people who preceded Darwin or who opposed his theory. So when we hear, for example, that nothing in biology makes sense except in the light of evolution, actually nothing could be further from the truth. Because I was very pro-evolution uh, until about 10, 12 years ago. And um, I, I'm a firm believer in it, hardly read anything to the contrary, and my wife felt to the contrary. She actually is a literal believer in the Bible, so we would have our discussions. And so I went looking for scientific evidence, something in the middle, uh, try to see if there were answers to explain both sides. And I came across a book called The Neck of the Giraffe uh, by Francis Hitchings. And uh, in it, he talks about there being no giraffe uh, predecessors and other problems with Darwin's theory. And he said that he went into this, writing this book, as if he was some neutral reporter, kind of walking between two battle groups. And he just kind of found himself swerving over to the anti-Darwin stuff because every, things were missing. Things were missing in the monkey fossils, things were missing in the whale fossils, things were missing in the giraffe fossils, and there were just so many jumps, uh, so many links that were missing. And so I went from that book to Michael Behe's book, uh, his black box, and then I went into some of William Dembski's books, and then the, and the whole host of uh, other uh, writers, uh, Jonathan Wells, and uh, a lot of people in Discovery Institute, and uh, and it got to be more and more interesting. Wait a second, here there's some problems, and so I was open to it, and maybe partly because I'm an MD, my profession, my income, what I do for a livelihood, what wouldn't be threatened. So, I, you know, I could say, hey, wait a second, maybe I had it wrong. But I'm not a creationist, I'm actually Jewish, and I'm not a Christian. But I get accused of being a Christian fundamentalist and a variety of other obnoxious things, which I don't literally consider obnoxious, but the people who say them think it's obnoxious. And at Caltech, when I was studying um, molecular genetics, um, I was, uh, sitting in a lecture uh, learning about the trip operon, how the cell um, accomplishes control of the process for making one of the amino acids. It's the largest amino acid called tryptophan. And I remember looking at this intricate uh, process that's activated on a molecular level, on a single molecular level, and how elegantly it turns on and off the production of tryptophan and I remember thinking, this is an elegant uh, regulatory mechanism that is being um, put into play at the molecular level, far beyond anything that I had learned as an engineer. And I remember thinking at the time that this looks like something, not just the product of engineering, but the product of brilliant engineering. And that was the point where uh, it occurred to me that someone needed to do the experiments to test whether that was really the case or not. I remember having these discussions with friends and saying, don't you think this is a little weird? <laughs> and uh, it's, it's strange how your preconceptions really color the way you process data. And some people just went along with what they were taught. And I never tended to do that. I was always questioning what I was taught, including Darwinism. There are challenges to Darwinism, although I can understand why some people with a very cursory reading of the literature might think there are very few. One of the reasons for that is the people who are finding things that don't square with Darwinism, A, 